The Rise Today inspirational podcast is brought to you by two relentless health warriors. Dr. Erica Harris, an empowered mindset health expert who is the passionate founder of risetoday.com and Megan Hubner, an entrepreneurial marketing strategist and founder of meganhubner.com. These two inspirational forces have truly thrived through adversity and are here to empower you to do the same. Together, they serve to open up the conversation about hardship and to move you to greatness through your adversities. Learn more at risetoday.com forward slash podcast. Now, let's get started. Let's rise today, right here, right now. Risers, and welcome back to the Rise Today inspirational podcast, where we passionately serve to bring you incredible stories of those who have overcome adversity, and where we passionately serve to propel tools to empower you and inspire you to stay the course and even thrive through adversity. <clears throat> Today's guest is an absolute exemplary example of everything we, we strive to propel on this show. Today, we have with us Canada's beloved Rick Hansen, the man in motion himself. This incredible man in motion, 26 month long tour, strive to serve, increase awareness and generate much needed funds for spinal cord research. Since then, Rick has dedicated and devoted his life to creating a world that is accessible and inclusive to all through his Rick Hansen Foundation. Rick passionately serves to increase awareness, to change attitudes, to create accessible space for all, and to liberate the amazing potential that those with disabilities have. On top of all of these incredible accolades, Rick is also a phenomenal athlete. He has won 19 wheelchair marathons. He is Canada's Disabled Athlete of the Year in the years of 1979, 1980, and 1982. He was inducted into the Canadian Hall of Fame. Rick has so many accolades, and we are so honored he is here with us today. Megan, will you please help me welcome Rick to the show? Welcome, Rick. We are so thrilled that you are joining us today. Thank you for, for being here. Well, thanks, Megan. Thanks, Erica. It's an honor, and I really appreciate the message that you're bringing to the world, especially during these challenging times. I think we all need to share our stories and build bridges and uh, feel that we're not alone and that we have ability. Uh, and to create this strong absolutely. sense of community. We're just so happy you're here. Rick, can you start by taking us back to that time when you were 15, this thriving 15 year old boy? Can you take us back to your story at that time? Yeah, you know, my whole life you know, growing up in uh, kind of small town, British Columbia was all about setting goals, chasing dreams, sport, physical activity and the use of my legs. And then one day I was hitchhiking back with a buddy from a fishing trip and the truck we were in the back of the pickup truck uh, with was uh, going around a corner and it crashed and threw my friend clear, but I, I was on the inside of the roll and it threw me to the ground and, uh, and uh, my back was broken and my spinal cord was damaged. And I literally was told a few hours later in a small little Williams Lake hospital that I'd never walk again. Uh, it was a pretty devastating uh, piece of news and one that I absolutely was stunned in disbelief uh, and had no idea what they were talking about. I can't imagine at the age of 15, what went through your mind originally? First part was that uh, clearly this must be a mistake and uh, well, either way, it doesn't matter, I'll will my way through it. And so every single moment of every waking uh, hour, I was uh, just uh, relentlessly focused on, you know, willing my legs to work again. And uh, interesting parts of that were that the, uh, you know, the, the days ticked by and and then eventually I realized uh, that uh, this was uh, incredibly serious because I hadn't had any progress. And, and then as the summer ticked away, uh, I started to uh, really realize that I was uh, in trouble and that this might not ever happen. Uh, I might not, this might be my, my future. And I had no reference to what that future would be. So I went into a pretty, pretty dark uh, period uh, feeling very hopeless and, uh, and, and really not seeing any any ability or potential, and this is in the era of uh, you know pre pre information age, no no technology, everything was word of mouth, and 
And so it was a huge mountain to, to climb at that point. And, and in reality, it was basically just a day-to-day -day struggle to, uh, to just bring it and, uh, and find some reason uh, to keep going. Absolutely. Do you recall how many years or months it took you to kind of, you know, you mentioned you were in a dark place. How many years or months did it take you to kind of find some acceptance into what your new reality was going to look like? Yeah, I think it was like a series of threshold places, you know, being in the hospital for four months. I started to, as once I got out of that striker bed for you know two months uh, without actually even being able to sit up and then getting into a wheelchair, it was sort of like, building uh, and crossing a threshold. And the first threshold was uh, that I saw the wheelchair as a symbol of disability. So I had to I had to really accept the wheelchair, even if I still thought maybe it would be temporary and, and see it as a vehicle to, to liberate my life, to get me back in motion again, even though it was still within the confines of the hospital and, and to reconnect socially and then you get comfortable in that environment and you say, well, this isn't so bad. And, you know, but then the next phase was to go to a rehab center and spend three months there and breaking that threshold of fear, the doubts, the mm -hmm. uncertainty. And, uh, and then, and then once you break through, you know, it's all new and you're un uncomfortable again, and you're learning what's next and, and another progression of uh, learnings and people and experiences. And then you get comfortable and then you have to break again because you're going home now to your old world where yeah. you're, you know, you're, you're facing family and, uh, and, and friends and wondering what they think. You're facing barriers that you couldn't imagine. Uh, and you're trying to regain a sense of equilibrium that, that you can still be the same person. But uh, what, what, what are those hopes and dreams and needing access to role models and information and, and, and pivotal points along that journey helped me move to the place that I guess transformed my attitude from being uh, feeling uh, like a pity, uh, you know, depression, anger, mm -hmm. uh, to hope and possibilities. And without those threshold moments of people uh, to, uh, to give me perspective, to offer love, support and encouragement and, and paint that dark canvas to, with points of light, uh, color, texture and possibility, uh, I would have never, I would have never gone past that. And I couldn't imagine what my life would have been. Truly incredible. Impressed period of about two years. A yeah. Truly remarkable. I want to pause and highlight on one of these phenomenal tools. As you were talking, you, um, you know, had described this, this will to make your legs move and then going through this dark phase. And in terms of acceptance, you had to look at this chair and really change the way you chose to see this chair, right? right. And that's such an important part to highlight. It, it really is our choice and it's an active choice that we make to change those habits. I know for myself on my own journey, very different story, but also the, the way that I chose to see chemotherapy at the beginning of my journey as very toxic, right? Killing every other part of myself as well. I had to also shift my mindset to choose to see my chemotherapy as my sunshine vitamin, right? The vitamin that lets me be here today. Um, but that also has to come from an act of choice. And you really phrase that really beautifully. So I just wanted to highlight that and creating these inspirational role models and being educated, getting that information, all phenomenal tools. So thank you. Well, the perspective issue, you know, we all create these maxims uh, throughout the course of our lives, you know, I'll never be this, or this is never going to apply to me. And, and when we embed them, uh, as long as they work for us at the time, that's great. But when things change, um, those maxims can be handicaps. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and really, little did I know, my view at the age of 15 uh, about disability uh, was, uh, was really, really great limited mm -hmm. towards others because I didn't have much experience towards others. And then secondly, as I now had a disability, that meant that I looked at myself as being limited and, and attacking uh, each of those maxims first the wheelchair as a symbol of disability. Second, uh, you have to be strong and independent in order to be whole and, uh, and, and to you know, measure your worth, self-worth based on that. And yet now I couldn't use my legs. Now I was totally interdependent on so many other people. And, and that, that threshold had to shift very dramatically to realize also that asking for help and being connected is a powerful human trait. 
And secondly, to know that, that when you do ask for help, you're not a burden, you're actually activating one of the most powerful human dimensions that anyone can have, which is to know that you are of worth, that you can offer support to someone in need, and that that is uplifting. And, and that is a, another handicap that really, really stuck to me for the longest time until eventually I started becoming comfortable with the idea. And, and it really, truly, I think, made me whole in spite of the fact I couldn't use my legs. And that, uh, and that really was when I started to get back truly in motion again. And that's a really powerful of, statement. Yes, that process of what you're talking about, right? This this will to make anything happen and then I'm going to conquer it all, right? And then you go through this down part. It's it's often the same for for cancer patients, let's say in my shoes. I too felt the same way. It was also surreal, right? And I've got this, no problem. Um, I'm going to carry this forth. And then and then the reality kind of sets in, right? And then we're more real with our emotion. And so as you talk about like creating the space to be vulnerable it in turn creates so much power for ourselves to then move forward through that. So really important. I, I think the, the issue of space to be vulnerable is also about, you know, that when we have something that comes out of the blue and hits us, no matter what it is, there, there, it, there's a trauma. It's a blunt force that, uh, and, you know, you could say that in many ways, COVID is a trauma to, you know, the entire planet at this moment. And so if we, if we don't process that and then reframe, uh, you know, that, that handicap, uh, you know, that trauma force can be within us, uh, no matter how hard we try to move forward. And one of the, one of the arts for me, uh, you know, which is counterintuitive as a young 15 year old, uh, 16 year old is try to learn how to share, share my feelings and, 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 and open up and, uh, and lean on friends or trusted people who, uh, who could help me, uh, you know, kind of, talk through and experience and go through that really gut-wrenching, painful, emotionally rotting at period where you just, you just feel like you're just done, yeah. but yeah. someone is there uh, and, it, and it gives you incredible hope and, and a sense of connection. So that, I think that was really instrumental in helping to process a lot of the trauma mm -hmm. that uh, I was dealing with. Yes, absolutely. The, the power of conversation, the power of building that connection is, is such a such a strong thing in our society. And it's so, so valuable to us, especially like you mentioned, the current COVID situation that we're in, you have to strengthen that given a, you know, a big change in the prognosis of the life that you had envisioned and stuff, you need to build those connections. So, you know, if you're listening right now and this story is hitting home for you and things, make sure that you are taking that time to build the connections with your community, to be like Rick said, vulnerable. He's on the other side of the diagnosis and he has gained so much strength over the, the number of years that he's been contributing to this mission and cause. So really take the time to build those connections and relationships and strengthen them with yourself. Find the strength and don't look at it as the weakness, like you mentioned, Rick. It's great. Well, I think it's a I think, journey. I think you yeah. phrased it so beautifully, right? How we how you choose to reframe your mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah, and, it, and it's a and constant it, battle that we all have to do continually, right? And we're continually challenged with new adversities and we continually have to reframe. Exactly. every day as we go forth. And Rick, I love how you've taken your adversity and you really have also thrived through this sense of service and contribution in what you have done in moving forward. And please take us back to, you know, the inception of this Man in Motion tour. Tell us yes. about your thought process. Tell us about how this was launched. Tell us about it all, please. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, the first part is you know, anything that we usually do is a result of our personal experience, our insights, and then things that we identify in the world where we can perhaps apply our talent and uh, connect that to our passion, whether we're a team member, uh, whether we, uh, we are a leader, uh, it doesn't really matter what your role is. It's that process. And for me, the inner, the inner drama and challenge of uh, translating from, you know, again, stereotype, stigma, victim to empowered agent was uh, super important uh, realizing that it wasn't just about me it was also about the you know the people I connected with who still would look at me often uh, you know with a lot of pity and uh, you know they'd see me you know happy and beaming as a as a world-class athlete and yet because I was in a wheelchair uh, their views were that oh well you know isn't that isn't that sad you know that you, you can't walk and and for sure it's uh, it's everyone everyone would like to walk and be fully physically able, but you can still be 
pull and still have a meaningful life. And, and so I, I experienced that. And as a Paralympian traveling the world, I met hundreds and hundreds of Paralympians who shared the same stories. And we all battled twice as hard through the physical barriers to actually get, uh, you know, to be able to even get in the door and, and play or participate or compete, whatever it is we were doing in, in life. And so these barriers were everywhere. And, you know, you've got two choices. You could complain about them and, or, or you can look to inspiration and see how you can match your talents and your experience and the barriers you see uh, with solutions. And I, I chose the latter. And I was deeply inspired by my teammate, Terry Fox, uh, who played wheelchair basketball with me. And I recruited him when he just lost his leg to cancer. And Terry and I, we grew up in the culture of this little wheelchair basketball team called the Vancouver Cable Cars. And we were incredibly impacted by our role model, Stan Strong, who was the team manager. And he was a, a paraplegic and he was injured in the 1930s wasn't expected to survive. He spent four years in a hospital and, uh, and, and, he, and he, he was discharged into a life filled with nothing but barriers and limitation. But this guy beamed, beamed love and passion and uh, acceptance and yet purpose. And, and he was giving of himself to help people like Terry and I and uh, just live a life uh, and be normal. And you can't help but be affected by a guy like Stan to get called into service and pay it forward. And, and so uh, when Terry decided to well, make his uh, Marathon of Hope journey uh, a reality by uh, running across the country on one leg for cancer research and to cure cancer, um, I, I watched that journey and obviously we were cheering as really great friends. And mm -hmm. what I saw as the secondary outcome that he hadn't anticipated was that it was really impacting the way people viewed people with disabilities, they started to see ability. And, and I realized that by that time, being an ultra marathon, uh, you know, champion, uh, I, I could actually put that, put that talent and, uh, and, and perhaps one day wheel around the world to demonstrate the ability of people with disabilities if barriers are removed and challenge people everywhere to do the same, remove barriers, talk to local champions, family members, and, and help uh, raise up that potential and liberate it. And so that was my view uh, at the age of you know, 25 when I really decided to commit and 27 when I left. Uh, little that I realized how big the world was and how disconnected and inaccessible it was. <laughs> wow, so remarkable, Rick, so remarkable. Well, it was, a, it was a process and many people, you know, again, connecting to help you place and, and put the dots together to be able to make a commitment. And, embark on a perilous and uncertain journey and put your life out there and be surrounded by a, a, you know, a small group of passionately committed team members who work tirelessly giving up their careers and, and put everything out there to try to help make this dream a reality and make a difference. It's, it's right. incredible. I mean, it was over 35 years ago, right? You finished in 1987, covering 26 months over 34 countries and 40,000 kilometers done in your wheelchair. And that impact, you know, I can't imagine if you were to go and do that circuit again, how things have changed and the awareness that you have brought to all of the places that you had traveled. Well, it's, it, you know, when you're moving hard and, uh, and, and, you know, and you know, you're just trying to, you know, get one stroke and then another and then another and put 17 million strokes together to complete your journey. It's hard to look up and see all the uh, all the potential impact, but it's really uh, it, it's truly inspiring even today to hear stories where certain people were uh, involved either as volunteers or supporters or you know in a crowd somewhere or you know as uh, as Erica mentioned uh, you know even after the tour you know in, at an event and something about uh, the message uh, not just uh, during the tour but what it was striving to make people realize. Uh, was having an impact and and that's uh, truly humbling and clearly that's why we put all that pain uh, that, that 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 endurance and uh, perseverance to uh, you know to try to achieve something meaningful yeah i will comment and i will share it to our listeners what we were talking about before the show because having you as a guest today it's so truly impactful for me because i was sharing with you before that 
um, just before my diagnosis in 2012, my then husband and I had attended one of your fundraisers at the Pacific Coliseum here thank in you. Vancouver. And it was a, yeah, no, thank you. And it was this grand affair with live music and the energy was phenomenal, right? And just days after that, I had been diagnosed and you've always served as this inspiration and this light on my journey with the message that you propel that anything really is possible, right? And even in the face of hearing hearing no and hearing that there were there were no treatment options and hearing the words of this two-month terminal prognosis i really continue continually propelled that anything is possible mantra in my mind and you've really served as a light and it's just such a full circle story to have you here with us today rick i also want to take a minute and comment on you know some of the tools that rick just shared with us without even putting it in the form of a tool but choosing those that are in our inner circle, right? They say that we become most like those five people that we spend the most time with. Rick was just sharing, you know, Terry Fox and those in his circle who truly inspired him. So look for your inspirational role models, whether they're in your circle, if they're not, change your circle. And, um, and others too, right? Look to Rick and look for, to others who are inspirational role models. Write down their traits and their skills and their values and what they have pursued on their journey. And this sense of contribution in service is such a phenomenal way that comes, it rebounds back to us and propels us to thrive by the idea of rising by lifting others. And all of these tools are so, so powerful. So I really hope these are all resonating with you, our risers today. And then Rick, tell us, you've launched the Rick Hansen Foundation and you've continued to spend your life dedicated and devoted to increasing awareness and increasing accessibility and inclusion for all. Tell us about your pursuits, please. Well, you know, there I was finishing the end of the Man in Motion tour and uh, going through that final banner, 40,000 kilometers, having raised awareness and $26 million for our, our, uh, our legacy and, and thinking my, my contribution was over, you know, as a volunteer, uh, you know, a year and a half to start and, you know, two, two years, two months and two days through the journey and obviously another, well, probably six months or so to wind down, uh, but uh and then get back into my athletic career. But I, in reality, there was a sign behind me that said, welcome home, Rick. And above it, it said, the end is just the beginning. I kind of <laughs> off <with> that. <laughs> when I first saw it, I thought it was some crazy marketing person that just didn't really get it. I was so, so done. <laughs> but it, in, in reality, the, the tour uh, was just like a baby step of, uh, you know, a massive, you know, multi-generational journey. And, and I'd learned so much and, 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 and really, realized that that it not was wasn't just a you know a, a special contribution it became part of my life mission uh, you know I really realized that there was uh, there were so many challenges out there and, and there was so much to do and and that I actually had perhaps the passion and the uh, and the leadership ability to go after other dreams and bring it other teams together and 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 hopefully continue to remove more and more barriers to get there uh, faster so um, yeah, it was, it was a big shift. And for all those years, uh, our foundation was created and, and we've got an amazing board of directors who, uh, who actually uh, guide our, our executive team. I, I've uh, you know, elevated from being CEO to now founder and, and I am able to uh, really see this independent team just continually you know, growing and doing more and more work. And it's such a wonderful feeling as a, as a successor strategy where you are the founder and, and you you know that that the organization is poised to do way better work than you ever could have imagined and done on your own and uh, and well into the future long past your lifetime uh, moving from one man in motion to many uh, all over the world creating a global movement and so the three big things that we're working on you know as an organization in the area of accessibility is making sure people realize that disability is a big deal People often only see disability as a, uh, you know, uh, just people in wheelchairs, you know, it's sort of like the, the international symbol for accessibility is stick man in wheelchair, uh, you know, and so it's natural, I guess, but it's also one of the most visible examples, but there are a lot of varying disabilities, visual, mm -hmm. hearing, mobility, cognitive, and, and many of these disabilities, uh, you know, that you, that you can't see. 
uh, and, and mental health is a, an example, uh, or people living in pain, or uh, you know having uh, you know other challenges that are just not so obvious. And so I think what we need is a, a different reset on that iconic brand uh, trust mark on uh, levels of accessibility to some human in motion liberated by barriers removed that everybody can identify and relate to, because then that starts to expand our view of what disability represents, and then it makes us realize that. Yes, when the WHO puts out a statement that there are over 1.3 billion people on the planet today living with a disability, and it's the world's largest minority, and that there are still fundamental barriers to not only human rights, but to full cultural and social participation and contribution, it compels us to realize, my gosh, we have to work harder, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because if we want a, a vibrant and sustainable country and world, we have to do it uh, because we yeah. can't afford to trap and segregate mm -hmm. and isolate this incredible human um, population who are just w wanting to be normal and whole and participate like anyone else and contribute. So that that's a top priority. And then to shift attitudes from negative to positive and to see ability uh, in everyone. And, and ultimately then attack and, uh, and remove the physical barriers, especially in the built environment. If we can't ensure that the places and spaces that people live, work, learn and play uh, are accessible to everyone uh, in the built environment, then how can we you know, become more uh, accommodating in our service or more uh, supportive in our employment practices or our products? Uh, you know, people, people really need to know and trust that from a global perspective, we're using a, a world-class standard for accessibility that we can measure it and that everybody is involved in building and operating buildings is trained based on the same credentials and capacity and then that we can rate and certify and, uh, and let everybody know all those great places that are accessible and maybe even beyond to be gold at, with innovation, thinking about how a building can work and how people everyone uh, can actually fully participate and contribute. So that's our goal. And that what that allows us to do is to allow allows millions of people to speak the same language, measure the same things and participate in a common barrier that so many people with disabilities can uh, opt into in spite mm -hmm. of the fact their disabilities may be different. The solutions are supportive for all. Yeah. You touched on a few really good points there, um, you know, primarily that the amount, the sheer amount of people living with disabilities, both ones that you can visually see and the ones that you cannot see as well. And the number is so staggering. I think you had quoted earlier, it was one in seven, correct? Yeah, yeah one in five uh, by 2030. Uh, and, you know, and so it's moving up really quickly. Uh, yeah, due to our aging population, it's... Yeah, um, it, it so, I mean, your work is is so intentional, given the fact that we, you know, that our population is aging and things. But you said a few other things that I that I really uh, kind of clicked for me: empower agent and seeing the ability. And I love those two statements because it is really about the view of how we see ourselves and how we can then help see other people see themselves as well. So I really think that, yeah, the, the see ability that's just absolutely beautiful. Instead of seeing just the disability that we're looking at physically. Well, and of course it's about people. And if we, mm. if we open ourselves up to, to, to people, of course, what we, what we try to do is we try to accept them, uh, know and accept them as they are, but also in our journey together, we, we can find the unique perhaps uh, barriers that exist. And, and then our job, you know, whether we're an employer or a family member or a friend, ideally it's, it's to help them uh, you know, when when uh, required or called upon uh, to be able to uh, see those barriers remove and see see their potential rise up and uh, and ultimately be unleashed and that's uh, that's all that I think anyone really wants is to yeah. is to have a chance to be able to bring it. You are such a phenomenal example, Rick. You choose to rise. You chose to rise when you were fifteen, and you still choose to rise today. You choose life you choose love you choose passion you choose giving back and pursuits and uh you choose to not be a victim and you are such a phenomenal example i am just so in awe of having you here and speak with us today well thanks erica and thanks megan yeah, you guys are you guys are awesome really yeah. uh, really appreciate what you do and taking the taking the message out to so many people and 
thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Absolutely. If we could just leave our listeners with one piece of advice, Rick, advice to someone who has really recently been diagnosed with a disability in whatever mm -hmm. shape or form it comes in, what can you yeah. tell them today? Most importantly is never, never give up on hope because hope is something that we can have things happen to us that we can't control. Um, but the one thing we can control is our eternal clinging and view and, and, and belief in hope that indeed, uh, you know, that life can continue. Indeed, I can, I can truly tackle this and ultimately move forward. And, and to, to have hope by being able to make sure that we, as we struggle with the true pain and suffering that sometimes hits us that we can't predict, that we can actually still see beauty, uh, love and life and meaning and purpose in every day. And the balance of that, the duality of that, and the space between what's happened to us and what we choose to focus on is that mindfulness that, that we own. That's our sovereignty. And we, we have to willingly give that up or we can willingly cling to that. And I think your examples are absolutely uh, the epitome of that. You've, you've chosen hope and, uh, and you've chosen to, to act in that space. So it doesn't mean you you give up on, uh, on, on the notion for me uh, of, or others of a cure for, for paralysis. And of course uh, that, that will happen one day. And, 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 but at the end of the day, in the meaning, meantime, it's, it, it's making the best of what we have and, and hope endures and it powers everything. Sometimes Beautiful. we have to look for it and, uh, and, or we have to be reminded of it as well. Beautiful, Amazing. truly, truly beautiful words. So to all of our risers and thrivers, I hope today that you are inspired to choose to rise. I hope you see that happiness is truly a choice. Let's make the action steps towards that. All the best, everyone. Have a great week. Thanks, you guys. Take care. Thank you. It's gonna be a good day. Thanks so much for joining us today. Take this inspiration forward. Learn more at risetoday.com forward slash podcast. And please do help us in our mission to spread hope, inspiration and positivity by encouraging those in your circle to join us and to tune in for our next show of inspiration coming soon. Please contact us if you have a powerful story to share with us to inspire the world. Until next time, get out there and rise today. Rise today.